Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Boom. Okay. Uh, nice to see new faces. Nice to see old friends. Nice to see uh, names that I haven't run into before. Nice to be here. Um, yeah, so uh, this, you know, the STOA works on a gift economy. And I like to say that your presence here is already a gift. And, uh, and I really feel that uh, every week. So, um, you know me, of course, I have stuff that I can do, but I was wondering if there were some um, questions in the space or in your imagination, um, a lot of, or irritations. Uh, uh, it's always, it's always irritations, answering irritations is always a good way to go somewhere that we haven't been, um, or just queries or for those of you who haven't been here before, if you wanna um, jump in and uh, give us some idea of what you might be interested in, uh, I'd like to start with just kind of getting a sense of who we are today, which is different than who we were uh, last week, uh, and different from who we were a minute ago. So yeah, just let that feed the space um, for the next five or 10 minutes. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, so that, so uh, someone just asked to think about, uh, talk a little bit about the levels of deanimation. We talked about that last week. Um, so I really appreciate when, when people ask a question like that because I wouldn't necessarily revisit it to go into more detail unless there was energy for it. So that's something we can certainly talk about. Okay, uh, curious about the conversation. Okay, so, um, well, I've been recently bumped to the sense-making space, so uh, I don't know if I should frame it that way. Uh, basically, we have been um, trying to um, have each session be work like a one-off uh, so that people, new people can participate, get the whole, get a whole package. Um, but there is a sense that there's, you know, we're building on themes, we're building a certain capacity. Uh, so if you're a new person, please um, um, uh, ask me to uh, re recapitulate or go over any terms or something that you hear in the space uh, that, uh, that you're not interested. The conversation is very broad. Uh, we're mostly looking at things like um, trying to get at the bones, the bare bones of things. So the bare bones of experience, what's under the hood, the bare bones of um, uh, metacognitive way to look at our own mind, uh, the bare bones of uh, complex terms like power, trust, etc. So we're trying to uh, have a powerful direct conversation around um, uh, uh, topics or themes that have become very complexified in the sense-making space. And then how can we get to this kind of crisp, simple uh, way of understanding things? Like we, we've done this a lot with some of the meditation techniques so that then we can start from a, a kind of a clean sense of something and then you can build up and complexify it from there. So that's, that's kind of what I think we're trying to do. Um, take a lot of the bullshit out of the conversation and uh, yeah, trying to get down to brass tacks. Um, so let's look at some of these questions. Uh, I watched first uh, uh, mapping, tracking, and hacking. Oh, okay. We can do that. I have to write them down because I can't watch tracking and hacking. 
those are really good in the sense to make your space uh, conversation going. So let's make a web ecology. Yeah. So uh, that's so like us to go meta on our own uh, <laughs> emerging process, but we could talk about that. Uh, the ecology here. Um, uh, okay. So let me do this. Let me talk about the sense making ecology first, because I think that answers like what's the conversation here. And then we'll look at uh, revisit the notion of systems thinking, what gets deanimated. And then we'll say that um, instead of systems thinking, what we can can we do? And uh, David Chandler has a book called Onto Politics, and he says there's different ways to do systems thinking. And uh, we can look at mapping, tracking, and hacking. And, and so that, that kind of, that will be our narrative arc today. Uh, the sense-making space. I think, um, you know, I was just talking to Peter about this and, and from my own experience, um, I think uh, the STOA, I, we were talking about um, the difference between tribes, mimetic tribes, and what I call totems. In my work, I say build totems, not tribes. So tribal is all about um, collective memes, let's say, memescapes. In the early tribal cultures, they weren't just humans, intersubjective collectives. They were actually tribal clans. And the clans, the totem included not only humans, some humans and not others, but also the landscape and the, and the, and the plants and animals that were part of their diet and the sacred parts of their spirituality and the tools and technologies they, they work. So you'd have the forest clan or the river clan were fishermen. And so this notion of broadening it from just tribal and mimetics, mimetic warfare, to what is the stoa as a totem? The stoa as a totem is a platform. It's a place, right? It's this, that's what Peter says. It's a place to have conversations. And I think that the part of the landscape here is the way Peter has designed it. So we have maybe who's a clown and she does these really cool psychotechnologies and raven we have all these different kind of aspects to the landscape that kind of hold the diversity rather than some of these other sense making spaces you see they start with this notion of let's have conversations and they tend to converge into a meme uh, really quickly. The IDW did that really quickly. I mean, all they did was like five people interviewed each other, right? So, so um, I think that um, um, now there's, there's could be reasons why people intend to uh, converge um, into a conversation. So people like, for example, Jordan Hall and John, John Verveke are talking a lot about the religion that's not a religion. And they're kind of like, uh, his, uh, their new series, The Civium, is kind of moving toward a vision. Um, but um, um, I think the, the, so there's, I think the sense-making space is being populated by, um, by shows that are trying to fight the inertia of becoming, um, uh, becoming a certain kind of meme. Uh, um, I see over time, for example, Rebel Wisdom. I mean, it, they, they, they do a very professional production, um, but you're starting to smell a narrative arc. It's almost like they see a narrative arc that they're always going toward. And uh, they produce their videos very well um, it's, it's, it's journalism. I mean, it's like investigative journalism. So there is a narrative arc. Uh, so there's a sense in which, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's emergence and you have a new, a new kind of sense-making platform. And then so far it seems like, um, 
they pretty much converge on a meme memeplex, which is not a bad thing. It's just uh, it's just an it's it's different than, for example, if I or maybe or Raven did our own thing, it would probably also have this more sense of convergence. Um, so how can we get out of our own way? Um, uh, yeah, and you know, and the other thing is, once you have these uh, convergences, then you start to have discontinuous conversations. People start to stereotype, uh, in in a sense that, that in the way I just did, that this is the kind of conversation you have over here, and this is the kind of conversation you have over here, and this is the kind of conversation you have over there, and then you get the dynamics of social sanctioning, what you can or cannot say. Um, it's an interesting time to be in this space because all those dynamics are happening. I think you all know, right? You all can tell that there's a lot going on um, in the lived experience of people who are who who, who are uh, setting this stuff up. Um, was that helpful? Is there a, a follow-up question to that preamble? Um, I also want to, uh, while I'm thinking, um, mention that uh, lately um, I've also been trying to expand um, what what shows I watch. You know, I I, I talked last time I watched uh, Mark Blythe. He's an economist. Um, I've been watching a lot of Bloggerheads TV. I had lo a long time ago. And then recently, uh, we started to revisit it. These are really interesting. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot of kind, there are a lot different kinds of stuff that are happening in other sense making spaces. They don't call it sense making. Um, so just trying to um, stay broadly informed around uh, people's ideas about what's going on um, is, I think, very helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about um, Peter. Did you want to respond to that? Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, Peter, do you want to respond to that? And I'll talk a little bit more about totems. Um, Tanya just said, "I feel curious about Peter's potential response to what you just said." And I wrote idea sex. <laughs> so oh, okay, that's uh, what you were response. talking. That's okay. My yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, so um, totems, totems are the, um, the early um, totemic cultures, clans, small bands, um, they, um, they uh, the, the totem, there were animist societies, and so with this, this can tie into what's deanimated. They were animists, and we think about animists as um, giving uh, personhood to, for example, some, some plants and animals and trees and rivers and forests. But what's interesting about the animist clans is that only some people were considered human and only some plants were considered sacred and some animals and not others. And it all has to do with um, who could eat and who gets to be eaten, right? So um, the for if you are a forest person, you didn't really see the river people as humans. We did, they didn't categorize that. The way we categorize life forms now is this kind of evolutionary kind of species dominance hierarchy, right? Um, so uh, insects are at the bottom, you know, plants, insects, birds. I don't know why birds are there. Um, or, or reptiles, birds, you know, we order, we order these, these, these families, and then humans at the top. And early man did not order that way. Uh, this is actually, uh, they ordered based on um, what was vital to their, their, their habitat and their culture, right? 
So some plants could be eaten, other plants were sacred. And so you wouldn't, you would just maybe use some of the leaves and continually to uh, replant them. Some humans could be eaten and others could not be eaten. Uh, some landscapes were sacred, some others were not. So the collection of humans, animals, plants, and landscapes that were sacred were, was the totem. And that's why you have totem poles, right? You have the bird was sacred and this, these parts. Some in indigenous Aboriginal tribes and other tribes, uh, landscapes could be sacred too, features in the landscape. So that was the unit of coherence, not the people as the unit of coherence in, a, in an environment, right? The unit of coherence had these other um, entities in it, what we would call other categories because of the way they categorized it. And so for me, this notion of um, <clears throat> tribal mimetics, which got very popular uh, about you know eight or 10 years ago, um, seemed silly to me. So I, I was like, uh, the, tr the, the tribal type um, behaviors happened when the totems themselves were destroyed, when the landscape was destroyed and this interbeing with nature and other aspects. And so, so um, I like to go back to the notion of totem. So what, not only who are your people, but what is what is your sacred place? And it could be this digital platform. It's a sacred place to Peter. And what are the what are the aspects of the world that you rely on? These are all part of supporting um, this. And what happens is when you extend it to the world, it's not, you also um, st stop. Uh, you also provide more space, as I think this is one of the reasons why the stove is like this for diverse opinions so like if you have a community house people started having like uh community houses and co-working spaces right so the actual physical location is part of the totem and then this allows many different type of people to come and go versus bounding the thing by a, a meme space and so uh acknowledging the habitat or the habitus or the built environment in which you hold uh, these explorations and discovery is part of the move from tribe to totem. Did I answer that and not come good? Was, is that? Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's a little shift and I think it's a cool, cool way to remind ourselves of these things. Um, uh, yeah. So, one of the things that's interesting, I'm going to tie this into de animation, is that when you see we started categorizing, um, <clears throat> we stopped categorizing that way and we started categorizing as uh, primarily humans, animals, and then we get to plants, uh, which in our modern world we start to de animate, even though they move and they grow and they communicate. Uh, but certainly objects and landscapes we've de-animated, which means we don't see them as agents, action, in intentional agents in the world. We see them as we are agents and we can operate on them, but they don't operate on us. Okay, so uh, we, the way our mental model works is we de-animate um, part of the system. And this is quite interesting. Um, I started to really think about this. I had two experiences. Um, one was I was watching uh, Planet Earth. Uh, that was a DVD series a lot, quite a long time ago when we used to buy DVDs. Uh, and I think it's Morgan Freeman is, you know, narrating it. And it's the episode where the water is coming back to the Serengeti. And he's talking about all the herds of animals that are moving to the water, you know, the, the elephants and the giraffes and the antelopes. And something switched for me and I saw the water, not the, not the animals moving toward the water, but the water moving the animals. It had such power, right, such vitality that it moved huge numbers, millions of animals every year. And 
then um, one time I was going where I used to have my horses and it was one of those days and I was coming down the hill where, you know, the sun makes these like bridges to heaven kind of looks. It was a very, very spectacular morning, early misty morning. And my horses were eating grass. And for some reason, it wasn't intellectual. I, I, know, I didn't see them eating grass. I saw the grass growing horses. Like the, 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 causal, the causal relationship flipped for me. And I was like, oh my God, my grass grows horses. Like, like really, you know, the, the, the power of grass to grow horses. And now I talk a lot about the power of coffee. Coffee moves a billion people every morning. And you can say, well, that's just playing with, with language, but it's not. It, there's something that animates us. There's something about the nature of coffee that is not trivial. And tea and opium, I mean, tea, the tea wars and the opium wars, right? So you start to enter this world where of neo-animism, where you start to see your relationship. There's always omni-agency or omni-participation. And you start to become um, aware of um, that you're 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 a participant in this in this interbeing, all this aliveness and this this action all the time, and um, and you start to have reverence in a sense because if the coffee is moving you, you know you could say you could say does that make me a slave to the coffee? Well, in a way, but also. It's like, it's, it's a gift, it's a giving all the time. There's a, there, there, you allow it to be animated. You allow that experience to enter in the language of it's an, an, an actor uh, with you. So um, um, color is the same thing. It's not trivial. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of omnidirectional participation. So why does this matter? Uh, outside of that kind of a mystical experience is that, um, first of all, um, when we first started talking about ecological management, we make this mistake. We're going to manage the ecosystem, right? You see, we deanimate the ecosystem as, as if we could operate on it where it can't operate on us. And of course, this is how we destroyed a lot of the uh, key ecosystems during the the environmental revolution. Um, we make this mistake many, many times in terms of thinking, uh, like in management. We have uh, 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 management systems theory. With a manager, if he, create, if he chooses the right model of hu the human system, it can act, the manager can act on the human system as if it was an object, right? And this turns out to be uh, really ridiculous because you get uh, people are not objects and so you get deviant behavior and adaptive pushback. You get all the little ways that people are saying fuck you. You know, they're saying yes to the consultant, but they're they, but because you've set it up so you're not including their 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 subjectivity or their agency, um, you get a lot of adaptive adaptive pushback. So uh, it's true for coronavirus also. You know, like how can I engage with the agency of the virus in a way, almost like there's a mutualism going on, like I understand it, and then how can we live together versus, oh, let's act on the, on, on the, on the virus. Um, uh, it, you could see it everywhere because, for example, the virus, the coronavirus, um, these, all these viruses come from um, concentrated animal production, right? That's why they call swine flu, avian flu. Uh, um, and so, um, again, we, at, we, we work with animals as if they're objects and they just meet production and as if that the life in them is not going to have an, an, an effect on us, right? So, um, all these these ways of uh, these are all these are all uh, mental problems with our mental models, um, and we constantly deanimate we deanimate our bodies. You know, we just say, uh, if I take this pill, then my body will then I'll I'll get better or something. You know, 
but the body's going to have a response to that pill, and it's a very complex response. It has an active plays an active part in that. Um, yeah. Um, and just to notice what you're in, you know, what are you participating with and what is participating with you um, creates, it enlivens. I mean, it's actually overwhelming. There's too much, there's just like too much going on, right? Um, but that's, so, um, so that's one way to deanimate that we can act on the system, but the system as if it's an object that's manipulable, that we are at, we have a privileged position from which we could act on something. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, there's, there's, that's called the privileged position. Another way of deanimating is um, uh, Kant came up with it, McLuhan popularized it. It's called dual causation. So the popular phrase, uh, um, the popular phrase, um, we create our systems and then the systems work on us, you know, uh, um, this is called dual causation because when you think of yourself as creating the system, you have agency. When you think of yourself being uh, constrained or compelled by the system, you don't have agency. Um, so there's that, that move that's deanimated. Um, a lot of these uh, uh, paradoxes, uh, process thinking uh, fixes, but uh, I'm not gonna go into that today. Uh, the third way of looking at systems is a little less, these, are, these move toward fixing the problem. So the privileged observer is a big problem. Dual causation, well, at least you got a couple of things happening. Uh, it's a little bit of a dance. The next one is um, where you, your mental model is that you're a participant in the system and your actions are a source of gaining information about the system. So this is, um, this is very similar to uh, sense making, Dave Snowden sense making. I have to act in the system and then I get more information about the system that I'm acting in. There is no outside. In this, there is no outside. Um, so, but the system's still a little deanimated because see, I'm getting information about it as if it's a, uh, as if it's a landscape that I'm studying, right? But at least th this is a more sophisticated. All right, so those three are all in the space. The third one is more sophisticated because we understand this problem. But then there's a new one that I call critical reflexivity. This is where you realize that the mental model of inside and outside the system itself is problematic. Right? So then you move toward more of this omni animism, this omni participation, this, there's no inside and outside. You know, there, there, the question of that is the, or, or the construction, the mental model of that is dropped. So, um, and you get into you get into enacted theory and stuff like that from this position. So th that's kind of like my my download on on uh, the animation. Is there any questions? Did, did that um, did that make sense to you? And, and I, the idea is, what are the what are the psychotechnologies we need to make sense in this new world? And I would argue that the fourth, okay, the third, all right, it's doing. Uh, we're moving towards that, but the fourth one is really important, but it's very hard to uh, embody or ad adapt the fourth one if you don't have some lived experience of this like uh, omni animation or else it'll just be conceptual. You can't work in the conceptual territory. So this is why sometimes uh, these the psychedelic experiences where inside outside drops gives you a really good hit of uh, that kind of reality that you can draw on, right? It can't be just conceptual. Um, um, yeah, so that's where my work is. I mean, I spent all my time at the, the edges where nobody else is, but, uh, um, yeah, so those are, those are, that's a whole series of, um, 
different ways to, to, to do systems thinking, right? So you see people like uh, Snowden and Nora Bateson, they're on the third level. There's no outside, Nora Bateson, you know, uh, everything's in between the spaces. Uh, this is already a very emergent new way of looking at things, uh, but I think there's there's a there's, there's a step beyond um, that. Hopefully, we're we're getting to, um, yeah. Um, it's why I have a radical critique of Keegan's systems thinking level. <laughs> it's, it comes from the uh, vantage point of the privileged observer. Um, it's not where I think we should be going. And young people don't need, you know, one of the things, the problems we have with, you think in terms of developmental theory, developmental stage models for education, we have this sense that people need to uh, get the wrong kind of systems thinking first before we can teach them the more advanced type of systems thinking. Uh, this is not true uh, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, there's something about children are thrown into the world where the advanced type of systems thinking already makes more sense to their lived experience. And secondly, the real problem we have in thinking as older people of thinking in these new ways is that we've been conditioned to think in the other ways. And so we have to double dip. We have to deconstruct our old habits in order to move into the new habits. So um, I was having this conversation just yesterday. We're building a really cool curriculum for the Montessori High School in Washington, DC. And they wanted to use the term systems thinking. <laughs> I went on my little rant uh, and um, I made some points, but in, in general, they said, you know, they, and, and I agree, there's got to be at least some development of systems interweaving holistically in order to take the next step. But uh, I think we're all on the same page. But um, so this conversation is happening in a practical way, uh, very large funded project for the Montessori School in, in uh, Washington, DC. So we can go from like the meta analysis and to understanding these things are moving into the more popular consciousness really, really fast. So when I think of touching back on the tagging back the sense making space, um, obviously there's a lot of people who, if you listen to them, you can tell which one of these, which one of these uh, vantage points that they're, they're standing in when they're doing complex thinking. Are they standing in the vantage point of the privileged observer? Not so much anymore, but maybe, uh, maybe a little. Or are they, they uh, using um, something else? So uh, yeah, okay. So um, that was already a lot. Um, um, so hopefully that makes some sense. Does that, anybody have a question? And then I can tie it into mapping, tracking, and hacking. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about the, the deanimation animation idea has been flowing in all week. And I'm thinking about it in terms of the way we have conversations and what's allowed and what's not allowed in that space. And oftentimes when I am in conversations and I can relax, I get imagery. And when that, when I say, oh, I have a, this image of like roots interlocking and they're rubbing on each other in a way that splinters or something, um, was the last one that happened in conversation. It can be really generative and it, it often loops back around in the conversation in really interesting ways. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about it in yeah, and just like what comes up, how, and who is welcome to speak is another aspect of it. Because oftentimes the people who are functioning in these other levels are not, they don't fit into the logical, systematic, you know, part thing that's so prevalent right now. So yeah. I want to throw that in. Yeah, so um, that's something that um, was evident in my collective insight practice experiments. You know, a long time ago, uh, in the 40s, they had this, these two guys, they were working for a product company, appliances like thermoses and stuff like that. Um, and they created this thing called Synectics, I think. 
and it's not worth reading the book it's so 40s ish but what they would do is they would have uh the designers go on a va on like out into the woods in a cabin and they'd lock them in retreat for a few days you know this was back when people wore ties and everything to uh to uh uh to work you know so we're talking about the 40s early 50s and they would go out to these cabins and they would brainstorm product innovations and so uh they and and it was all like off off campus they got to be thought as like crazy kind of cultish artists as product designers but um it, as it grew you know they couldn't like actually pull this off together so they had the sec they had some secretaries come so that they could bring the food and you know make the beds and cook and stuff like that and that's why they invited them but in between the secretaries would saunter into like the retreat and it's a it's a real sexist reality when he's in the book but um and they would be listening to the men uh, talking about, you know, uh, washers and stuff inside the thermos. They were trying to invent a new thermos and all this stuff. And the woman and one of the secretaries was, because it's a transcript book, you see the transcripts. And one of the secretaries was just listening, you know, she wasn't going to really participate. But then she's like, tells this crazy story. Like, it's like my washing machine. And when it goes like this, I always feel like it needs, wants to stretch. I mean, it was really this really fantastic imaginative kind of embodied imagery she was having that seemed like the guys were like oh my god you know but then someone went wait that reminds me of something and so they started to realize that having these imagistic non-concept what i call them is uh i call it uh sophisticated naive participants right so because you don't know the field and you're not using your mind and you're drawing on these like images or the bodily felt sense, they become very, very uh, generative in these spaces uh, for, for collective insight. And so, um, you know, in my collective insight uh, practice uh, workshop that we did last month or the month before, the second the second skill we learned is working with provocative objects, like letting the image come into your, you know, why, why is this image of roots? Why is, why did I look at the root? You know, what, what, what is, what is, this is, these are not trivial. These are not trivial ways to cognize uh, complex uh, problems. They're actually quite sophisticated and necessary. And uh, in collective space, the luxury is that uh, you don't have to do it all yourself. If you happen to be a model builder and you're mapping, uh, you can count on someone like yourself to provide that other, that other energy, that other movement in, in, in the space. And that should be encouraged. Uh, that should be encouraged. Also, what's discouraged are negative energies, like irritation, very strong ir irritations also provide very important part in collective uh, practice. Um, and, it, and, and when those energies arise, a lot of times it's not what the person's saying. You don't engage with like, a lot of times with the words. It's like, what it, it's like you try to feel into the energy. Why is this energy in our space? It's not trivial, right? Uh, yeah. It's hard to do, you know, it's hard to do over this technology where it's very conversational. Um, okay, um, so mapping, tracking, and ha hacking. Uh, these are three terms that come from uh, David Chandler's book called Ontopolitics and the Anthropocene. It's a horrible uh, title because you wouldn't necessarily pick it up. It's much, it's a cool, cool book, little. Uh, he actually calls it mapping, sensing, and hacking. Um, but when I tell you what he means by the second term, I think the word tracking is much better uh, because sensing and sense making has, is so much related to embodied sensing. So, um, <clears throat> um, Chandler says that 
um, in, the, the, in this complexity, our environment is so complex that uh, certain tools that we have to understand things have been uh, broken down. The most important one, I'm not sure if he starts this way, I'm telling the story. I gotta frame it somehow. So there, there, the most important uh, tool in the modern world is if then causality, propositional statements, okay? So uh, before about 5,000 years ago, uh, mythic consciousness, they did not have the ability to make if then statements. They didn't have that mental modeling. Um, um, so, and around uh, Plato and Plotinus discovered if then thinking, they called it the awkward path because if then, then this, and then if then, then that, and it creates these huge systems. Well, then if that, then this, and if that, and this, it gives us the ability at this point in history to create hyper objects, huge complex systems where the causality is so complex, we can't track it, we can't find it. So this is not a, uh, disputed idea in uh, advanced uh, uh, intelligence or academic communities. Uh, even uh, retired General McChristie uh, knows this, and that is we are facing challenges now where we cannot address with if-then propositions. If we can't address them with if-then propositions, then we can't have hypothesis, we can't test them, hence no science. Science as we know it is obsolete in these situations. So we call this complexity science, but uh, the word science is, is, is like oxymoronic because of what I just said, right? Uh, so I like to call it complexity thinking, <clears throat> or uh, Edgar Morin calls it complex thought. So um, I had this conversation once with uh, Soryu For All, in, uh, in San Francisco. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was giving this presentation about, there was a time before if then thinking, and then there was a time with if then thinking. Now there's a time where if then thinking is obsolete. And he came and asked the question and he said in his way, what if there is no if, and no then. Okay, so that's very deep. We're gonna put that aside, but um, that's how the story ends. Okay, so there's no if then uh, thinking inside these. So then how do we proceed? Like, how do we ask questions? How do we inquire? How do we face problems? Or how do we design our dreams, right? How do we do that if we have to move beyond if then thinking? And um, uh, Chandler says, he sees three types of experiments happening in, in our world today, uh, driven by the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, we try, we try, we try, we try, science doesn't work anymore. So he calls the three mapping, sensing, and hacking. So mapping, he says is, okay, so someone who's a mapper is David, uh, Daniel Schmattenberger. Mapping is, trying to figure out all the causal linkages and the tropic cascades and the complexity. Uh, um, so, so he's a really good uh, example of what, uh, what um, and you see uh, Schwartenberger do this all the time. He goes on Facebook and he's like, who knows about this? He wants to map more stuff onto that. And who knows about this? And he's constantly trying to map these things. And Chandler says, well, that's cool, but the problem is that there's infinite causal depth. You'll never, it's, it's, it's not a project you can finish, okay? So, but that's happening. So he calls that mapping. Um, and then the second thing he calls sensing, but I think we should call it tracking. This is the use of AI to detect patterns that correlate with probabilities. That's why I don't like it, sex thing. It has to do with the surveillance state and tracking. So for example, there's in this, in this modality, there's no causal explanation interpreted, okay? So let's say the AI 
notices, you know, deep pattern recognition, like the things that Google are working on. Let's say AI notices that when women are wearing fuchsia in Britain, there is an uprising in the Sudan. Okay. Now, no one's saying there's a causal relationship to that, but it might be, this is horribly simplifying it, but it might be that the ship that is, uh, buys the color future that's popular in Britain is also smuggling the drugs or something like that. But the idea is we don't care what the causal connection, it's just that these things seem to be correlated at t sometimes and not at others, and AI can track these. Where, so, so this is how they, you know, all that work on where's terrorism cells. Uh, you know, is it, is this terrorism cell gonna ignite something? This is AI tracking patterns, patterns of, uh, you know, they're not really listening. Very, they're not really listening to conversations. They're watching patterns of connections between cell phones, you know, these, these giant patterns. So he calls it sensing. I think you agree it's better calling it called tracking. So they're not really looking for causality. They're looking for uh, in significant correlations. All right, and that's an AI driven thing. Um, all these moves, by the way, that you see in the Internet of Things space um, lend themselves to more and more of this modality of, of, of human human reasoning um, because, um, um, you know, what it's that they have multiple consequences. So having a uh, uh, self-driving vehicle uh, can save on greenhouse, greenhouse emissions. Um, it can also centralize the supply chain and make a few people richer, but it also creates more surveillance because each one of those uh, trucks is is a node in a in a surveillance network, right? So all of these things, it's a very large movement of the human species. This is the predominant energy uh, right now is this tracking tracking modality. So the third one is called hacking, and um, hacking is. Um, Try, is, is what we've been doing here, trying to use embodied sensing to hack through some of these limiting constraints or limiting perceptions or mental models. I consider Jordan Hall's source code uh, hacking. Uh, my work, uh, deep, his deep code, my source code, these are hacking modalities. Like how can we just hack the entire human project and like, get down to simple, powerful protocols, right? So we know about uh, uh, use our body to take action, reduces the complexity in the space, hack our mental models. So this is a third modality that um, he identifies, which I think is the smallest. It has the least amount of activity around it, actually. Maybe not for us. Um, this is kind of what most of us are involved in, but uh, uh, it's, it doesn't have a lot of traction. So uh, people who's looking at what is community, different types of government, different types of economies, what, what is money, all this meta inquiry around, well, what is money? Well, what is governance? Is trying to get underneath it so you can hack it and disrupt it and move to like an orthogonal direction. So. Uh, these are three modes that are, um, he argues, and I would agree, uh, are changing the human mind, right? The, the complexity of a mythic world changed the human mind, and what emerged was if-then causality. And now we're at uh, a point where um, that doesn't work anymore. It's a, it, it, it's a really important critique. Uh, for example, um, both the notion of deanimation and if-then causality is a powerful critique about uh, the carbon solution to climate. If we take, if we pick carbon out of the air, then we'll be okay. Then the earth will be fine. It uh, deanimates the uh, forces to, uh, of the earth, the hydrological forces, etc. And um, it's simple if-then thinking. It's not adequate to that conversation at all. Um, this is why, for example, 
I uh, get criticized for not taking a stronger stand on climate, stronger stand on policies that have to do, um, that are very active in leftist politics right now. Um, although um, I participate um, in that reality at that level, but what I show up to teach is in this genre. Um, all that conversation seems horribly inadequate to me. It's simplistic, reductive, deanimated, if then thinking. And I think it, it, it deserves its space, but that's not my contribution. My contribution is to point uh, beyond that. So that explains that. Uh, and you can apply that to the racial conversations also. These are too complex. What are, how can we, we need, a, literally, we need a new mind at the scale of um, the axial age. The mind that emerged all over the world, interestingly enough, in the axial age was a totally new mind. And um, we won't get there probably in my lifetime, maybe not even yours, but it's not up to us either. This is something that will happen to us. Okay, are there any questions in there, Peter, that you see? Um, mapping, tracking, and hacking are models of new approaches to solving complex problems that are so complex if then thinking does not work. I call it numinous causality. The causal, uh, uh, they're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And this has to do with, if you understand what we're talking about, if you don't deanimate any of the system, you see why you have numinous causality. Not because there's cause and effect. There's only active agents everywhere, sensing and acting. Not cause and effect not adapt adaptation, sensing and acting into new possibility spaces. That's all there is. Sensing and acting into new possibility spaces. Yeah, so that's what keeps my blood flowing. <laughs> Gets me up in the morning. Thanks for the question. Yeah, how do we proceed? Sensing and acting seems hard to understand. Um, well, <clears throat> all these methodologies are helping in this direction. So, so um, uh, we started off many sessions ago talking about the incessant talking in your own head, right? The incessant conversation in your own head. Well, uh, if you can't eliminate that, it's hard for you to sense and perceive. And then it's really hard for you to see, ah, there's possibility opening up everywhere. I just have to move into it. So there's, there's, and that's what I'm saying why there's hope because there's a reason why all these modalities are in the human system and gaining a lot of traction. They all kind of are leading toward this, this, or beyond even what I'm looking at. Um, um, so there's many steps in getting there. There's many, all the things you're doing, it doesn't seem to like, if I was a, a life coach, I'm like, oh, what's your plan? <laughs> and I'd be like, what? why are you doing all that? You know, like, doesn't sound like a plan. Well, actually, it's actually a great place to be in this kind of environment where there's just, you're just, uh, yeah, and look at the Stella's, I think that's what the Stella's trying to offer, you know. Why is that, you know, I don't, you may be meditating in a, with a bunch of Buddhists and you're like, I don't really believe that, but why are you, like there's a lot of people I know, they love the idea of going to the monastic academy and they see there's something there that's essential in this space. And they're like, I don't really want to be a monk or a Buddhist. But you see, the things we're looking at, it's kind of like when you're starving for something, or like, uh, um, you have a scent for this is this is this is what you're hungry for. So you just 
move in these directions. Uh, even if like conceptually you have a critique of it or you're like, ah, I'm not gonna make it, you know, it doesn't make any sense rationally. Ah, but you can't turn away or it still has your imagination. Those are good things to follow. Like, why are you here listening to me saying these crazy things? Uh, never coming to a conclusion. Well, this is all part of what's operating in human evolution right now. So uh, next week, I would like to, this has been awesome, and I, I really appreciate the break and uh, getting caught up on questions. Um, next week, I would like to talk about uh, what I think is the spirituality we need. I like to enter this conversation around the religion that isn't a religion and stuff like that, and maybe try to get some parameters around uh, um, try to hack, right? So the way I do it is hacking, trying to get down to some brass tacks of uh, um, what I think is the spirituality we need. Uh, what, are the, what are the parameters of uh, an effective spirituality? And of course, a lot of what we said, we, want, we would like that, or I would like that, uh, in, in this in that spirituality too but um, maybe we can derive some some commitments that make sense to all of us or at least give us a snapshot and we say no we can see the fault lines like we're going to outline some commitments and we'll see oh that's why we don't really match because my commitment is here and yours is over there a little and then we can kind of dissect uh, some of that conversation in helpful ways and that would be a hack, hacking modality. One thing I'm interested, Bonita, uh, maybe in a future session, is uh, getting your thoughts on the wisdom gym that is forming here at the STOA that could help us with, you know, practicing this stuff. Because um, it's organically emerged. We have like 10 recurring events. Um, and I originally did the wisdom gym at Rebel Wisdom, their community thing, because I was their community manager at one point, then the STOA came alive and I pivoted to this and all my attention was on that. And I think something really special could happen there and like with all these different modalities that could come and have a regular um, kind of space there. So yeah, I'm really curious how to sort of uh, cultivate that and get your opinion on it. Yeah, I would say you're spot on right now, but I'm not sure I have anything to add, but I guess you're having like, we could talk about that. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really have, you know, I'm, I'm a Taoist, I did Qigong and Tai Chi for a long time. I adapted that to working with horses and training stallions and I spent a lot of time in nature. I don't really, I mean, I've done a few meditation things here and there, but I don't have a, formal practice. Um, I've had a lot of very interesting state experiences, some of them uh, quite profound, but um, yeah, I haven't spent much time on the cushion. Okay, Peter, what's coming up? Um, what's coming up? Uh, we got collective presencing at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time, um, and then we have uh, another. What of the store too? I'm viewing it as kind of a psychotechnology incubator where people can come and test new things. Uh, so today at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we have an emotional dojo, um, and then tomorrow we have the dangerous space uh, at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time, where we talk about dangerous ideas uh, in such a way where we don't get gaslighted or hijacked by them. Um, so you can go there on the website, the, the store.ca to check that out. Okay, so the STOA is supported by a gift economy. Your presence here is already a gift. It's a wonderful gift. I like your smiles. And um, yeah, but if you, if you feel uh, that you'd like to um, contribute more, there's a gift page at the STOA. 
and uh, there's a lot of cool drawings of people who participate in the Stella, so um, it's worth the visit. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully you're in a position where you can give. Uh, did, did you like your illustration, Benita? Uh, I don't ever like anything like that. So <laughs> it's not, you know, I just, I didn't cringe, but I don't like, I don't like representations. They don't ever like, you know, seem to match my inner experience. So it's okay. Next time we can do an interpretive uh, surreal uh, illustration, just let us know. Just colors. Just colors, color, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.